Grab your history books, Wargamers, and your revisionist history books, because today we're looking at the history of the First Elopation War. A history that is not yet written, because we've got something fairly big to resolve. It's been over a month since you guys saw the last First Elopation War video, so to bring everybody up to speed, just to remind everybody, the uh, Dextran King, King Morningtide III, wanted to take over Sinistrea, and he negotiated a marriage between his eldest son and the eldest princess of the Sinistrean kingdom. He sent his son with a dowry, and the princess took the son and the dowry and eloped, which was great for King Morningtide III because it gave him a pretext to invade the smaller and almost defenseless neighboring nation. He sent two big armies, and they went and curb-stomped an army at the Battle of Silcock Farm, invested Leftopolis after a siege lasting um, about two weeks, sent a second army up to Baybury to lay siege to it. What he didn't realize is that the Sinistrians had split their forces and sent a small army around south, and that army, after a short siege, took Fourth Wright City. That's where things ended. With two capitals, both in enemy hands, what do we do now? I threw up my hands and said to my commenters, help me out here. I have no idea what to do here. We've got some issues with the fact that messengers take a full two weeks to get from one side of the country to the other. And so because of that lag, you had a weird situation where after the war was over, the capital city fell. Now, I don't know if there's any real-world antecedents to this. I do know, and Andrew Parkin pointed out uh, very, very wisely... There are actually two examples of this happening in the Napoleonic era. Vienna fell and the Austrians fought on. Napoleon famously burned Moscow and then suffered tremendously in a nice long retreat. Now, granted, the Russians had St. Petersburg, but, but well, you, you get the point. Just because your capital falls, it doesn't mean that the fight is over, particularly if your royal family is able to escape. Right Again, Napoleonic era, the Portuguese family absconded with the, the crown jewels and basically the wealth of the nation when uh, Napoleon's forces came knocking on the door. Does it help us here? Well, not really. Um, so another couple of really good points. Uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So that really is, I think, the fundamental question is what happened to the royal families here? Were they able to retreat to raise more forces? I, they would have advance notice. I mean, for one, you've got a battle that slowed this army down for two or three days. Over here, you're going to have some, some militias in the area. You're going to have outriders and scouts who will return and say, hey, you know, there's an army that's um, three days out. Well, three days is enough time to retreat back to uh, Boulder Run or even all the way down to Aero Autumn Front. One thing that I'll point out, so that's kind of hanging out there right now. What happened to the royal families? And, and we're going to resolve that. There's a bigger question we have to resolve we're going to get to that. Sit tight. Before we mention that, I want to talk about the historical precedent of why would you put your capital on the frontier of your nation? Well, capitals are not always cited based on their defensive value. Political considerations play a huge role. And in the um, pre-Westphalian era... Typically, royal families came from a, a town or a city, and you had a collection of people from that town who became more and more powerful and exerted more influence over the neighbors, and more and more and more, and eventually you had a royal family. You can see this happening in the ancient era as well, where walled towns, like a little town, you might have heard of it, it's called Rome, had like, what is it, 30 to 60 you know, what we think of as royal families calling the shots, and then, you know, they're jockeying for position within the city, they're trying to use the city to get gain position, and eventually the next thing you know, whoops, you, you just conquered the entire known world. What are you going to do? Uh, Rome is where Rome is, and the fact that the Romans were happened to be the city that conquered the known world, it just is what it is. Not often that you move your capital to a more defensive location. It happens in my own case, the United States of America, uh, they put the capital in a swamp. Now, they did that because nobody wanted it, and it was the, the only place that they could agree on. But also, at the time, when you had horsepower, the swamp was a defensible position. It was not an easy place to get to. So anybody that wanted to invade you, hi, Britain, 
would have a heck of a hike through some pretty gnarly terrain before they could get to it. So sometimes defensive issues, sometimes not. This is perfectly historical. I like this. I think it works really well for what we're doing. One suggestion that I would take it comes from commenter... Um, do, 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 uh, use a comment from William Corlett. Use a tighter map or a map with more objectives within a week's march. That's a really good idea. Um, one of the other suggestions, one of the things that came out of the discussion on the comments in previous videos is that we really have a limited number of locations here. It looks like a lot on this map, but we have a couple of problems. One is that if we had more minor objectives to shoot for, bit of a mistake on my part. Good old Bill Sylvester, he says you should nominate some foundries. I didn't quite get to that point. Foundries are places where your um, reinforcements can come from, and if you lose those, you're not going to be able to reinforce your artillery batteries. Another great suggestion, I don't have the name of the commenter that said pointed this out. He said, look, you've got a linear spread for the sizes of your cities. That's a problem. If you look at any map, you should have a hierarchy of cities. In other words, you're not going to have the same number of small towns as giant towns. You should have one big town. For every giant town, you should have two or three. Well, in, in this case, we have class A, B, C, D, and E. You should have two or three Bs. And for every B, you should have two or three Cs. So he suggests, instead of a straight D6 for nominating how big these cities are, it's really D10. Make your capital A, because the capital is going to be the biggest city. In any you know, pre-technological era, your capital will be the biggest city. And then you treat the role of a 1 as a B, a 2 and a 3 as a C, a 4, 5, 6 as a D, 7, 8, 9, 10 as an E. And that way, or is more of a spread like that, that way you get about half your cities will be these little guys. And you should only have, you know two of these, that gives you a much more, it, well, first of all, it gives you a bigger road network. So it gives you a lot more possibilities. I, I had two, right? Two roads plus one overland journey, which, I, you know, I thought three was enough. Probably not enough. If you really want to generate significant numbers of battles, you're going to need to do a slightly more complicated map than this. Live and learn. That's one piece of advice I'd have for anyone working through this through this exercise on your own, because it actually solves two problems. It gives you more objectives, and it gives you more routes of attack, and it allows you to have more than just two armies. Um, I think also my armies are a little bit too small. Um, you know, the, the battles that we're using, 2x2 two two Napoleonics, you're looking at uh, about 40 AP, and I don't think, I mean, I, I have the rosters over here. We can actually go back and refresh our memory with that. Um, the smaller... You know, the Royal Dextran army here is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Uh, it's really only about 25 AP. So that's going to generate a small battle, even if it's evenly matched. And when you're going up against a, a force that has a total of, like, 12, it's just not big enough for the rule set that we're using. If we were to double both of these army sizes, then I think we could have something a lot more interesting. Be that as it may, we are where we are. We know how we got here. We know what we have done. The question is, how do we move forward? And this brings us around to a mini discussion that a number of people brought up. And they said, hey, if the whole pretext for this war was the princess, whom we're going to call Helen, right? The face that launched a thousand cannonballs. A little bit of a hat tip to, uh, to good old John Scar and... Who came up with the name Helen? I, canonically, the princess that caused the first elopation war, we're going to call her red-handed Helen. We need to establish what happened to her and what happened to the dowry, because that's going to be the critical leverage. As things stand, when it comes time to negotiate the peace settlement that ends the first elopation war, as things stand right now, all of the cards are in the hands, well, I shouldn't say that, the stronger position is that of the Dextrans. Probably not going to be able to do an outright conquering, but if they could get a little more leverage over the Sinistrians, they may be able to just take them over. So, now we come to the crux of the matter. And that is where we have to look for red-handed Helen. 
And for that, we have, what's that over there? Why, it's a miniature war game. That is how we miniature war gamers resolve these naughty issues. So let's take a look at the game we're going to play. First things first, this game takes place somewhere on the northern coast between the North Runner River and the Big Windy River. That's this one over here. Somewhere in here is a small cove with a boat waiting for Red-Handed Helen. I want to go through the rules for this next game in this video because they're very complicated. It's going to take a little while to explain. Bear with me because I think you're really going to enjoy this. The woman in the green dress here is our instigator, the stunning and the brave red-handed Helen. She has her dowry, which she has taken, and then she has her foppish would-be husband, the uh, would-be King Morningtide IV, who, when he heard about her plan to escape with a dowry, said something along the lines of, yeah, Now, she has hired two gunmen to help escort her way over there to the other side of the battlefield. There's a boat waiting for her, and there's a couple of sailors in that boat. She's very strong, and she don't need no man. She actually needs four, because she is going to race straight across the battlefield to get to that boat. Unfortunately, it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be a walk through a dark and rainy forest. Let me show you what the terrain looks like. Yeah, it doesn't look like much, does it? Red-handed Helen and her two gunmen, a couple of sailors waiting for her on the boat over there. They're in a race to make it to the boat and sail off with the loot before they get caught by agents of either the Sinistran or Dextran nations. It's a dark and stormy night. Visibility is limited to that far. That is one long move. The actual terrain is not going to show up until somebody moves into that portion of the table. And for that, I've got terrain cards. I've got a walled meadow. I've got woods. I've got open space, cliffs. And those, we're going to shuffle up and we're going to lay out so that Mr. Wargames here doesn't know what terrain is where. That's going to be important because neither do we know which agents are where. Say hello to the hunters. We have four Sinistrian agents and four Dextran agents, all from Old Glory's Musketeers line. And... In each case, now, they're identical forces. You've got uh, the guys with their swords upraised. Uh, uh, you know, I probably should have pointed out, we're going to be using uh, Song of Blades and Heroes for this game. The guys with their blades upraised are heroes. They don't have any leaders. These are all independent actors. The guys that are rushing forward, these two, are going to be fast guys. These guys with their blades held at the ready are tough guys. And these two gentlemen who are just kind of ready for whatever are foresters. They can move through forests at will. So four identical forces. And they're going to be paired up as follows. Now, I've given the hero for the Dextrans the name, Van Hetteringham. He is going to be with the forester. We've got our tough and our fast hero, and they'll be together. And on the other side, we're going to have Shaw is our hero, who will be paired up with the tough agent, and then we'll have our fast and our forester, respectively. Well, why am I putting them on these cards? i got to show you what the other side of these cards look like so you understand how we're going to be using hidden movement. The backs of the cards all look pretty much the same. They've got a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And when the game starts, I'm going to shuffle these up. I'm going to put them in their starting position. And then these cards are going to move in a given direction. They're either going to be headed for the boat or to intercept Helen. Once they this card moves within a sight line of a terrain card, we'll flip the terrain card over and go, oh, there's nothing in this sector. 
Once this card moves within sighting distance of another card, we'll turn both of the cards over to find out who they are. Oh, Shaw and the Tough Sinestrian are going to encounter the Fast and the Tough Dextran. The numbers show exactly where our boys will be, so we'll roll 2d6. And in this case, we're going to be using Shaw and the Tough Hero. So if I roll a 4 and a 10, they will start here and here. We'll zip the card out, and now we know exactly where they were in that card. Everything is hidden until it is revealed. The stats for these guys range from quality 234, combat 234. Don't worry so much about that. We'll get into that when we actually start playing the game. But for the purposes of activation, we're going to treat each card as though it has an activation of four. That way, everything is going to still be plenty mysterious. And we're just going to go around the horn and say one, two, three. Because, bear in mind, we're not even going to know which cards are Dextrans and which ones are Sinistrians. Good stuff. So many mysteries. But wait, there's more. I have four conditional surprises for you guys. When the last agents are standing... We're going to turn over this card, and I'm going to show you what happens. If Helen... Now, she's an NPC, so she's just going to activate three dice every turn. As long as she has the mule with her, she's going to move slow, or short move, on every success. However, if she rolls a triple one... Now, she activates on a two, so if she rolls that triple one, we're going to turn this over and find out what happens. Likewise, if the Sinistrian agents... If three of them are gone, the last one is going to turn this card over and something interesting happens. Again, if any figure, any card, rolls box cards on activation, including Helen, we're going to turn this over. So many surprises in this game. I have no idea how it's going to go, but it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. So, the last thing we're going to do before we close out today is just remind you, this is all by way of figuring out what happens to Helen so we can sort out the the strategic level of negotiations and essentially set the stage for the second elopation war before we do that let me show you something so here we have our terrain cards and here we have our starting cards so we can mix these up and kind of spread them around i have no idea which is which do a little one two shuffle here and then we're just going to deal them out. One, two, three, and four. Likewise, so you guys can keep me honest, come around to this side. I am a right-handed shuffler, so what can you do? And the trick here is going to be trying to keep them one full move away from the starting points. So I have 16 cards, and I'm not going to tell you what's on them. Suffice it to say, you've got a nice mix of blocking terrain, terrain that blocks movement, terrain that blocks um, sight, and all kinds of fun stuff that is going to be fun to deal with. The one thing I want to do is leave a straight shot for our princess so that she can just make that run she did hire some very good guides after all we're going to take her straight to the waiting ship that's it we are ready to find out the fate of the two prizes both the red-handed princess and almost as important her dowry, the massive amount of money that would allow the Sinistrians to hire a mercenary army to launch an effective retaliatory strike against the Dextrans, or that would allow the Dextrans to hire a mercenary army to finally conquer the Sinistrians. Look for that in, I don't know, maybe tomorrow, maybe in two days. We'll see how generous I'm feeling. In the meantime, I'm praying for you.